My name is Charles Cecil. I am founder and CEO or managing director of Revolution Software and I am director of the Broken Sword Games. So the console versions um, very much build on what was done for PC. Um, we have considerable additional graphics. So at the beginning, for example, you have characters walking around, you have birds in the sky, you have pigeons, you have little fans. Um, and this, of course, is all stuff that we had wanted to do originally, but just simply ran out of time. Likewise, there are additional sound effects, a um, little bit of additional music as well. So just an enhancement of what already existed. And then some new features as well. Some of the feedback that we got was that um, people kind of lost track of some of the characters. So we put in a character gallery in which unlocks as you play through. Um, so lo lots of sort of incremental things that make the game a, generally a better, a better gameplay experience. Um, but, but nothing fundamentally changed. And the other thing that we, we, we uh, the, the team felt very passionately that, as we all do, that we should fix any bugs that we know about. And you could say, well, if you play through it and it crashes a couple of times, then that's fine. But anything that we could find, anything that we could find, we really worked hard on fixing and, and generally have. So it's, it's a very, the, the, the game went through first time um, on, on, on Xbox. Uh, and that's because it's just really, really robust code. We really hammered it and some of the puzzles we felt could be enhanced by changing the timings and changing elements of the script. So we weren't worried about changing whatever we felt would actually enhance the game. So it is, it is a considerable enhancement of what went before. And there's adapting it to the controller as well? There's adapting it to the controller, um, and um, we, we did a lot of testing to make sure that the best UI, we could get the UIs uh, as, as great as we could on, on, on a controller. Um, on, on the PlayStation version, we love the idea that you actually hear the telephone conversations through the speaker, so the, sp the speaker on the controller, so the ringing tone that you get on the phone comes through the controller and likewise anybody you're talking to. So we've, we've used the, the other thing on the PlayStation is that you can use the touch element on the controller as well. So we, we've really looked to enhance the game wherever possible through the opportunities made available through the hardware. So do you um, sense that there's kind of a resurgence in adventure games at the moment and broken, kind of the timing was right for Broken Sword 5? Well, there's been, the resurgence came when um, digital, di digital distribution mm -hmm. allowed indie games to thrive. And there's no doubt that adventures are niche. I mean, it's a large niche, but they are niche. And what was happening is that at retail, they were stocking just mainstream games, which meant that there was no opportunity for indie games to, to come out. With um, iPhone, which of course really built on the fact that you could use digital distribution to have effectively an infinite store, um, it allowed indie games to come in and compete head to head. So I mean, I was very proud when Broken Sword came out on the iPhone and we went head to head with, with Monkey Island. and We got much better reviews because we focused on the gameplay and they focused on the graphics. Um, and the, the playing field was very level, and that was something that Apple went out of their way to, to do. So that's, what, that's why, I mean, eventually never went away, mm -hmm. but the ability financially to produce them and sell them has only really been possible um, because of, the, because of digital, digital, digital distribution mm -hmm. on, on both um, iOS and on PC. I was going to say as well that Kickstarter is probably a factor in that as well, right? I mean, you've seen Double Fine having big success with their adventure games. Was that part of uh, why you took to Kickstarter with Broken Sword, seeing what's possible? What, what, what happened was that we, we were approached by Apple when the iPhone first came out and they felt that the games, our adventure games would work well. And they were absolutely right, they translated to touchscreen extremely well. We were lucky because we'd produced for Ubisoft a DS version. And the DS of course had the touchscreen and that was some sort of indication of what the game could, could look like, how it could feel. And we worked very hard to optimise it. Um, and then the next step was to take it onto the touch, finger touch screen. So we were able to sell the game on, um, on, on, on iPhone and then later on Android. And that was absolutely necessary for us because the model at retail just wasn't working for us at all. We'd lost an awful lot of money. We lost a huge amount of money on Broken Sword 3, even though the game was very profitable for the publisher. 
um, we took out a big overdraft, about £200,000. It took us 10 years to pay that off, and the publisher made millions of pounds of profit from, you know, right from the very beginning. It, it kind of just didn't work at all. Something had to change, and it was that digital distribution, the ability to sell the game on iOS that, that, that really made the big difference. So that gave us great confidence. We produced Beneath the Steel Sky on, on iPhone, and, and then Broken Sword 1, and then Broken Sword 2. And when we just released Broken Sword 2, we'd been invited, we were invited by Apple to participate in the 12 Days of Christmas, which uh, doesn't exist anymore, but um, it was a European initiative where a, an app was given away over the 12 Days of Christmas and then a film and then, and then music. And it was absolutely extraordinary. We had two and a half million downloads in one day. Now, we're a fairly small developer based in you know, York in North England, and the game Broken Sword became the it went into the top 10 most tweeted keywords in the world on that particular day. It was just mind-blowing. And it kind of opened up the opportunity that the world had really changed. Instead of having to go through a publisher and then go through a retailer and then the game is forgotten about after two months, it was the ability to repurpose a game that was effectively 15 years old and to go to number one across the whole of Europe and to do well in America as well. And that gave us huge confidence that actually adventures were popular, that they'd never gone away, but we, we were able to actually sell them in a way that hadn't been possible for, for 10, 15 years. And of course, Double Fine have done very well with, 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 with their Kickstarter project, so we decided to do the same thing. Um, and it was very successful. It raised $850,000, which at the time was the biggest UK games um, uh, Kickstarter. And also, we had 15,000 backers. We have 15,000 backers. And it's just brilliant to be able to communicate so effectively with so many people because, you know, they're a wonderful, wonderful community. Um, you hear nightmares about other communities and all the terrible things that are being, you know, that, that are happening. This is a group of people who, you know, sometimes we've made a few mistakes and sometimes they, they shout at us, and that's obviously absolutely right. Broadly, this is a group of people who get on extremely well, um, and I feel hugely privileged to be part of the opportunity to bring so many people together as friends. Um, it's great, it's extraordinary, and this would not have been possible five, six, seven years ago, um, but it is very much now, and it's totally changing the landscape for funding, it's totally changing the way that develop, games are developed, and it's allowing the indie, th indie scene to absolutely thrive in a way that just simply wasn't possible five years ago. So Broken Sword has a you know, very passionate following. Um, for people who aren't familiar with the games, is there any way that you're going to have for them to catch up with the story and become better acquainted with George Stobard before they jump into the fifth game? Well, what I was very inspired by Tintin. I mean, I love Tintin and I love the way that they're drawn. Um, and often people say, what is the timeline? And, and my answer is, it's like a Tintin book. And it was, it was intended to be like a Tintin book in that you could start, you know, Madame Castafiore, you know, you could come across her much later or you could then later read where she first comes in. And what I, what I want the Broken Sword games is to be like that. So we have Pearl and Duane here. You don't need to have met them before. George acknowledges that he has met them before, but you don't need to have met them to play this game. And I hope that people who play Broken Sword 5 will then go back and play Broken Sword 1 and meet, meet them for the first time. Um, and get a sense and then go back and play Broken Sword 2 and meet them for a second time. And that it doesn't really matter the order. So we don't need to put in anything specifically to attract um, new, new audiences. We just need to write the games as, as I think we have done so that you can either play it as a fan and you get the benefit of, uh, of meeting these characters again or you can play it from the start and just know that these characters have a history. I think um, on that front then, a kind of Broken Sword 1 to 4 collection for consoles would be a great idea. I mean, what do you guys think about that? It would be great. Um, one of the things that we have to be a little bit careful of is, I mean, th these, these backgrounds and the characters are, are in double HD and then they're reduced for an HD display. Um, so if you think of the, you know, the original graphics were 64480, in fact 64400. So on a big monitor like this, they'd look very, very pixelated. And that's not a problem. That's not a problem. And 
one of the things I was thinking about, because it would be really fun, would actually to play that up, instead of trying to blur them together so everything looks blurred, to actually see pixels um, and, and to, to, to reflect what they look like back in, you know, back when they first released, back in 19, uh, 1997 and 1998. Do you think there'd be an audience for that? Do you think, can you see a lot of people wanting to replay those games, you know, on their current consoles? Well, I think if people, if people absolutely accept that it is a, it's a retro game, and play it as such, then absolutely yes. And clearly the, the, the price has to be low as well. But, but, but that's the key thing. We need to make it clear that it is a retro game, that you're, you're playing a game that first came out um, you know, almost 20 years ago. And of course it's come a long way in that time. I mean, we can just see here how amazing the, the hand-drawn backgrounds are. I mean, how big an undertaking is something like that that you said like has five yeah, parallax I mean. layers and you know, all that rich detail in there. How, how big an undertaking is that? One, one, of the, one of the big, big issues of going to HD is that the eye becomes a lot more critical. Mm -hmm. So if you've got pixelated, then just a little pixel can suggest an awful lot in the way that you shade it. Um, and the animation can be much cruder in a way, much more stylized. When you've got high res, then your eye immediately is more critical of any errors. And so that, and also both with the, the backgrounds and the animation. So uh, any jumping is, is immediately noticeable, which it wasn't um, in the low res. So it's actually not only you producing things in a much higher resolution, you've got to make it, you, you, you can't, you've got to avoid errors that wouldn't have been noticed before. So it, it's a pretty massive undertaking, to be yeah. honest. Now, clearly, if we'd done everything in 3D, then that wouldn't have been a problem. But in 2D, um, to draw something like this that then gets scanned at a high resolution, um, you know, the, the, the actual bits of paper are kind of A3 normally levels. They're being expanded when they go onto a monitor. So, you know, the amount of detail that has to be put in is, is absolutely colossal. So it was a really, really big undertaking. Great. And now you've got Broken Sword 5 coming out on consoles. Are you eager to you know, build on the momentum and, you know, do follow-ups and things in the future? Oh, very, very keen to do follow-up at some point. And I've got some, I've got some really exciting ideas that it would be insane to talk about because they'll all change. Um, but actually, what I'm, I'm, I'm actually focusing on slightly different things at the moment because we have the freedom as an independent developer for our first time ever, yeah. we have the freedom to work on the things that we think are, that we want to work on, that we think will work for the fans. Um, and before, of course, you had the retailers deciding what they wanted to stock, you had the publishers deciding what they wanted to fund and then publish, and then we were very much beholden to this sort of chain of, you know, in, in 18 months' time, the publisher will publish it, sorry, they will publish it now if they think that in 18, years, 18 months' time, a retailer will want to stock it. Now it's much purer. We can, we can come up with ideas, we can punt it out to, 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 to our fans who will give us feedback, um, and, and if we need funding, then perhaps we can approach them for funding again. Yeah. Um, it's just so different to anything, any way that it's been before. Well, I imagine the research process must be a lot of fun. You were talking about it earlier with the conspiracies and theologies. So, um, yeah, is that, that's enjoyable as well, I guess. So yeah, if you do no, follow-ups, you get to And then there's also this that. extraordinary serendipity. So um, Broken Sword 5 is, is talking about Monsegur. Monsegur actually was one of the elements that, one of the areas that I researched for Broken Sword 1. Um, so all of these things feed into each other. So, so extraordinary serendipity. One, one, of the, one example that um, was really strange was that uh, I was in, um, I was canoeing down the Dordogne with my, my son, and my wife was just waiting for us in a tiny little village, maybe 200 uh, inhabitants. And she went into, uh, there was a church and an art gallery, and she went into the art gallery, and there was a book about the Templars, and she picked it up in the art gallery owner walked over and he only speak French and she only speaks English and it turns out that he was a guy called is a guy called Jean-Luc Chamoy who had researched the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail back in the 70s and had revealed that the person who claimed to be the Grand Master a guy called Pierre Plantard was an utter fraud an utter fraud and there are wonderful pictures of them but but through this serendipity in this tiny little village, we'd met the one person in the world who really, really knew about all of this sort of holy blood, holy grail theory. And as time goes on, maybe the serendipity is luck, or maybe it's just because connections are made and they, 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 they continue. But it's really exciting because 
actually all the broken sword games keep coming together. I was in the British Museum last week and you know, looking at that wonderful mask of the obsidian um, Tarantess Kaplapoka that features in Broken Sword 2. And then that opens up new ideas. So yeah, there are plenty of ideas and they kind of feed off each other. And they feed off each other because there are basic truths that run through the Broken Sword games and they then propagate other truths. And, and I guess as long as we try to be authentic, as, as authentic as possible, new opportunities, new stories will develop from the ones that we've already told.